Well, let's give a warm welcome to Hannah Earnshaw, who works at um, Caltech um, and is a Mars One candidate and will be speaking to us about faith and religion and deep space travel. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so thanks for the introduction. My name's Hannah. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and their. And the way that works is, uh, Hannah, they seem like a nice person. I like them and I liked their talk. Make sense? Um, so let's just check. Good. Um, so yeah, my day job is an X-ray astronomer at Caltech. However, I'm here in my capacity as a Mars One candidate and a person of faith. And that is where I'm going to start out my talk, kind of introducing myself and where I'm coming from. Um, not so much uh, as an academic perspective, but you know, something I have a personal stake in. Um, and I'm also going to look at some of the challenges that might be faced by the faithful going to Mars in the future. Um, so to start off with, um, I'll stick a, a vaguely relevant Bible verse up, um, because aside from a, an attempt at atheism in my first year of university, which lasted about a month, uh, I've been a Christian all of my life. Um, I come from a bit of an evangelical background, and at the moment, I'm a happy member of an Episcopal church here in Pasadena. Um, and some would call it an inherent contradiction, but actually I find that my faith and my career as a scientist are quite complementary to one another. The more I discover about how enormous and amazing the universe is, the more I can comprehend an enormous and amazing God. Um, and my draw to astronomy kind of feels a bit inevitable in that context because space taps into the same sense of awe and wonder and just the, the sheer force of wow uh, that I think of when I think about God. And it was that same kind of sense of awe that I felt um, when I stumbled across the Mars One mission uh, back in 2013, the mission obviously to establish a permanent human presence on Mars. Hello, fellow candidates. Um, and, you know, I knew in my gut that I wanted to do it almost instantly. And it took me a little longer to actually think about it and decide, yeah, okay, it's a good idea to apply. Um, and the first question that I'm asked um, about that is usually a kind of incredulous, well, why would you want to do that? Now, I hope that in this room, people have a better idea than most of the answers to that question. Uh, usually I'll touch on things like, I want to advance human space exploration. Um, it's a great scientific opportunity. I think humans are going to go out into space and we need to think about how we do that and how we do that properly in a good way. But for me personally, some of those motives are actually religious as well. Um, in my initial application form, uh, that I put when I was applying, um, I wrote the following. Uh, finally, this was point six of the kind of mini essay. Finally, as a Christian, I have a deep love for all creation. Mars is as much God's work as Earth is. And I know that my faith gives me a deep respect for it, as well as a firm emotional grounding for a lifelong dedication. Uh, that's a little bit dramatic, but remember this is a job application, you know, I'm kind of uh, pumped up about it. Um, but this idea of Mars as God's creation um, it's something that's kind of sat heavily on me throughout this entire process. Um, I see sort of space exploration as a bit of an act of worship in a way, um, seeking to um, glorify the creator by discovering and exploring and appreciating their creation. Um, it's a bit like a pilgrimage, albeit not one that I actually intend to return from. Uh, so here's a question, is religion going to Mars? Well, if I'm going to Mars, religion is going to Mars. You've got no choice about that. If I'm not going to Mars, though, is it, am, am I weird or, or what, what's going on? Because, uh, you know, religious motives intertwine with kind of social and scientific ones for me, but lots of people have a lot of different ideas about uh, what Mars might look like uh, when people go there. Some people believe that we can leave behind a lot of unhelpful baggage on Earth, like war or capitalism or religion. Now, the goal to create a peaceful and non-exploitative society on Mars is a very good one, but it's also a bit naive to think that we can just leave everything behind, including things which are quite fundamental to our identities, um, and start completely from scratch on Mars. And as representatives of humanity and its diversity, especially for a mission like Mars One, which is you know, deliberately trying to um, represent many facets of humanity in its crews, um, it only stands to reason that religion is going to come with us because 
the majority of the world's population, up to about 85%, does uh, identify in some way with a religion. But if religion is then definitely coming with us, what, what is it going to look like? Um, to try and answer that question, I, I took a bit of an informal poll of the Mars 100 candidates a while back, um, asking them whether they were religious, and if so, what they believed. And um, out of the kind of just over 30 who responded, um, there were 11 atheists, eight agnostics or with no religion. Um, so the font's a bit weird there, sorry about that. Um, five who considered themselves to be spiritual but not religious or otherwise you know, positively disposed to life having a spiritual element to it. And then there were um, eight of us who actually subscribed to a named religion, three Christians, two Buddhists, a Sikh, a Baha'i, and a Hindu. And I think there are also a couple of other religions represented in the wider hundred as well. So I can't make any great claims about a sample size is small, but it looks like, well, for the sake of argument, let's say that this is a sort of representative sample of the type of people who might end up going to Mars. It's significantly less religious than the general population of Earth, but um, about a quarter are still religious, and about a third um, consider themselves spiritual in some sense or another. Um, however, it is still a pretty widespread of beliefs in what will initially be a very small group of people, which leads me to my first problem, which I'm going to call the problem of community. Now, be it in a church, a mosque, a temple, a synagogue, a coven, or just even a family group, religion is rarely something that you do by yourself. Um, prayer and worship are all things that happen within religious community uh, as well as on your own. Um, and indeed, religious community provides often a lot of valuable friendship and social ties, often across demographic lines like uh, age, race, or class. Martians to be of faith will be leaving behind their family, their spiritual leaders, uh, their place of worship, and most other sources of religious community in their life. Uh, in a four-person crew, like Mars One suggests, uh, there might be one other person who is somewhat spiritually inclined, but there's probably not going to be someone who shares your religion. And in the early days of a Martian settlement containing of the order of tens of people, um, building religious community is not something that's going to come easily. Now, you might ask, well, actually, is religious isolation such a problem? There do exist archetypes of... Um, you know, uh, isolated religious folks such as uh, the hermits, monastics, um, wanderers in the wilderness, uh, people who, who live in caves and meditate and are okay with that. Um, and, you know, actually this, this kind of ties into Mars a bit. Life on Mars will be an austere and isolated environment. Uh, the luxuries of Earth will be inaccessible to the new Martian migrants, at least at first. Um, and the lifestyle is going to be hard and monotonous and kind of mundane in nature, really, uh, despite the fact that it's on Mars. We'll be growing food, we'll be maintaining the life support, we'll be building more habitats and stuff, but, you know, we do tend to romanticise it sometimes and it's not going to be like that. Um, it may indeed be helpful for the faithful Martian to kind of contextualise and frame these daily tasks in a sort of monastic sense, um, in which they're done for the spiritual development of self and the glory of God. But the issue with this is that all these examples are people who isolate themselves and live in austerity for the express purpose of religious devotion or kind of uh, becoming more in tune with the divine. And ultimately, religious devotion is not the primary purpose of the Mars mission, at least as far as Mars 1 is concerned. It's about establishing a, a foothold and a, a human presence on Mars for the sake of future generations. Um, you know, religion is a secondary motivation for certain people. And also, the, the crew members aren't going to be isolated from other people. They're going to be living and working alongside their crewmates. Uh, so, you know, they may still want to just take time out um, and, and practice religion on Mars, and they might want some support in doing that. Now, one source of that support could be via the internet. Um, while the time delay of communications means that we're not going to be live streaming any church services, um, there will be satellites in orbit around Mars, um, and we'll be able to, to access a lot of the, um, you know, online resources from Earth. Uh, religion is more and more present on the internet uh, these days. Sites such as Pathos uh, provide a kind of forum for blog posts and discussion around religious thought. 
Um, you know, churches will upload their sermons or pass around news by emails. Um, Hindu temples are able to convey darshan, which is the moment of seeing an encounter with a deity uh, through images and broadcasts online. And in general, there's a lot of scope for religious teaching and community discussion of faith on the web. Um, but with that said, the act of actually worshipping together uh, with others can't really wholly be replicated over the internet. And the sort of support network that you might receive from a religious community is likely more naturally going to fall upon your fellow crewmates who um, you know, know each other well and are committed to generally looking after one another. And given the breakdown of beliefs present in our typical sample of Martian migrants, um, it follows that interfaith dialogue and support is going to become very important to extraterrestrial religious practice. It's not necessary to share specific beliefs in order to kind of be available and, and be there for, uh, for your fellow crewmates to listen to them, to help them work through religious, um, religious ideas or just to worship in one's own way, but just alongside each other in company. What is necessary is a degree of um, empathy and respect for one another, uh, giving fellow crew members the freedom to follow their own conscience in terms of if and when and how they worship, and committing to help them achieve their goals, whatever they are. And so one goal of creating an effective and functional crew must therefore be to foster an environment which, um, in which crew members feel free to actually talk about their faith and, and practice it without the fear of being judged or mocked or coerced into something different. So now that our faithful Martians have got each other's support, um, what's actually the practice of religion going to look like? Um, and here we move on to something I'm going to call the problem of time. Now, over the short time that humanity has ventured into space, there's actually already been uh, quite a rich history of religious ritual. Um, on Christmas Eve of 1968, as the Apollo 8 mission orbited the moon, the astronauts on board read from the book of Genesis. Um, Buzz Aldrin uh, on Apollo 11 took communion before walking onto the moon, which was in fact the first thing eaten and drunk on the lunar surface. And now these initial expressions of Christianity from astronauts who are supposed to represent all of humanity were not uncontroversial at the time. But since then, a couple more religions have actually been represented in space as well. Uh, the Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, uh, while a secular Jew, wanted to represent all of Jews in space, and so he followed Jewish practice. Um, in orbit, requesting that his food be kosher and he observed the Sabbath as well. Uh, Sheikh Musafar Shukur, a practicing Muslim aboard the International Space Station, performed daily prayers from space. Um, daily, weekly, monthly, annual observances are all common across many different faiths. Um, they give the linear passage of time, rhythm and significance. And thus, some of the practical issues associated with that might start to become clear. When on the space station, orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes, how on Earth do you define a Sabbath, uh, which is defined uh, by sun, sunrise and sunset, by the way, um, when a week passes every 10 and a half hours? And when should one pray to Mecca? And how do you do that when the direction of Mecca changes by up to 180 degrees over the course of a single prayer? Religious committees actually had to assemble and discuss these very problems so that they could advise the astronauts on how to uh, faithfully go about their religious practice in the new environment of space. So uh, some of the world's leading rabbinical authorities advised Ramon that he could observe the Sabbath using the sunset times of Cape Canaveral, which was the point at which he was last on Earth. Um, in the case of Islamic prayer, Malaysia's National Fatwa Council convened and they created a document about praying on the ISS, which touches on a lot of the practical issues. But in terms of time, it actually you know, came up with the same solution, that you could kind of synchronize your clock to where you left on Earth. Now, actually, choosing a proxy point on Earth to set the times of religious observance um, is not peculiar to space travel. It has previous precedents. Uh, Muslims observing Ramadan during summer in the Arctic Circle, where the sun doesn't set, um, has, have the option of using Mecca time to define the sundown hours in which they're allowed to eat, uh, which is useful. Um, so synchronizing daily rituals to a spiritually significant place on Earth um, is one solution to this issue, which works fine for a temporary jaunt into low Earth orbit or a brief trip to the moon. But um, when we're talking about more 
a significant amount of time spent in space, if, if not the rest of one's life, away from Earth on another planet, then we need to start finding long-term solutions um, which have some context for the people actually living there. Uh, for example, while a default proxy time zone um, works fine uh, during maybe space travel, when you actually land on a planet with a functional day-night cycle, it makes a bit more sense just to adapt to that. Now, on Mars, this is actually quite simple because the Martian day is 24 hours and 39 minutes. Daily prayer and ritual, anything that involves sunrise or sunset, is really easy to adapt to. It, that's not the case on other planets, but let's not worry too much about that right now. Uh, Mars first. Um, ritual that depends on the moon is not quite simple. Mars has two moons, and their orbits and their phases uh, do not tie in in the slightest to what Earth's moon is doing. So anything that depends on the moon, be it maybe the, the lunar calendars of Judaism or Islam, or just calculating when Easter's supposed to be, suddenly needs completely rethinking. Uh, yearly calendars become an issue. Uh, just like days, years on another planet are completely unconnected from what's going on on Earth. Um, a year on Mars lasts 668 souls. So I'm going to do a little thought experiment uh, using the Christian liturgical year um, and you know, see what happens when we go about creating a religious calendar for Mars. So here we start out. I've got um, the, the Earth calendar, a typical liturgical year. You start out in ordinary time. You, you go into your 40 days plus the Sundays of Lent. Um, you have an Eastertide period, uh, followed by Pentecost. You have some more ordinary time. Then you have Advent and Christmas, and it goes around. Um, simple enough, right? Uh, so what I've done, I've transplanted that calendar, and I've just kind of plonked it on the Mars calendar, and i filled up the rest of the time with ordinary time, which I have coloured Mars red because I am hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, okay, that's... That, that's fine, we've got 303 extra days to play with, extra saints days, more liturgy, that's great. It doesn't really feel like it makes good use of the Martian year, though. You have, like, basically one and a half Earth years between the end of Eastertide and Advent coming round. Um, that's a bit rubbish, really. So if, if, we, if we find out a new way of calculating when Easter is, maybe based on the Mars moons or something else, and we put it kind of in the middle of the Martian year, like this. Now, th this looks a bit better. Um, we still got kind of a lot of empty space though, so, so maybe what we want to do is to just double the length of the seasons um, so you have more stuff going on. Now, if you, in case you haven't noticed, I'm being completely facetious here for a number of reasons, not, not least because the length of time of these seasons is actually significant in itself. The 40 days of Lent um, refer to the 40 days that Jesus spent fasting in the wilderness. If you double the length of Lent, then you kind of lose that symbolic connection, not to mention that 80 days of fasting is not going to go down well for Martian Christians. Awkward. Um, and of course, all of these solutions fail to take into account the previously mentioned problem of community. Because of course, all of these seasons are things that, on Earth, the church does at the same time altogether. There's some denominational variations, but in general, that's the case. And so if you try to modify an Earth calendar to another planet's year, that might well be a lost cause, because Christian Martians are going to want to celebrate Christmas alongside their loved ones and the rest of the faithful back on Earth. And that's going to apply as well to Passover, Ramadan, Diwali, regardless of what point in the Martian year it actually is. So, and so it's more likely that um, Martians will just simply synchronize their celebrations uh, with what's going on on Earth, and that they'll go round, and then halfway through roughly the Martian year, they'll start up again. And it won't really correspond to what's going on on Mars, but everyone will be celebrating together, and that's nice. However, the years of Mars are still going to have their own rhythm, um, and those who live there may still want to develop their own calendar of celebrations that gives their own year a kind of a structure and a narrative and a, a kind of a passing of the time. And even more so for the eventual next generations of humans on Mars, the, the children born there, who, for whom the, the cycle of, of time on Earth is only relevant because the rest of the humanity does it, doesn't mean anything to me. Um, so more and more, the new Martians will need and create festivals that belong to them, um, that fit into their own rhythm of life. So perhaps we'll see a Martian calendar kind of grow organically on top of the Earth calendar. So for example, uh, you might have a Martian New Year celebration, uh, perhaps on the anniversary of the first human landing. 
Uh, Mars has its own solstice, solstices and equinoxes and seasons. Um, and, and indeed, you have events like uh, planet-wide dust storms, which, you know, obviously one of them's dying down now. Um, and, you know, these are significant times accompanied by austerity and the conservation of energy. So perhaps that too will become a kind of mobile festival um, with weeks of fasting during the storm followed by celebration of its passing. But it is clear that on Mars and in space, we are forced to re-examine what times are important and sacred and, and whether they still make sense when removed from the context of Earth. And here we move on to our third problem, which I'm going to call the problem of space. Now, in the realm of science, humanity left Earth centrism behind a long time ago, uh, for the most part. Uh, in the sphere of religion, though, Earth is still often the center of the universe, at least metaphorically speaking, and for good reason up till now, because religion is all about humanity, how humans relate to each other, uh, the world around them, and the divine. So with humans limited to one planet, it's only natural that the scope of religion is also limited to one planet. We might you know, acknowledge that the rest of the universe is out there and God made it or something like that. But exactly what goes on in the heavens has never really been entirely relevant to the spiritual well-being of humans until now. And here we can start a long process of detangling what's important in a religion from any Earth-centric baggage. Um, viewed from outside of Earth, some of it stops making sense. Now, a particularly illustrative example of this, um, one that many people say doesn't make sense to begin with, but let's be charitable and go with it, is um, the kind of fundamentalist pre-tribulation Christian narrative of the end times. Um, first, there's a rapture, where all the Christians disappear and go off to be with God. Does this happen on Mars too? Because if so, we've just lost three Martians. Um, and then there's a tribulation, seven years of famine, natural, natural disaster, the rise of an antichrist, a tyrannical economic system. Is this all happening on Mars as well? Or, or, or are the Martians kind of looking over at Earth going, oof, oof, glad we're not there. Are they enjoying post-capitalist freedom while the number of the beasts wreaks havoc back on Earth? Or do they have their own disasters to, to worry about? Um, when Jesus finally returns to reign on Earth, will he rule over Mars as well? Or are we all just going to go to heaven? No space in heaven, right? That's fine. Um, important questions, guys. While such speculation is entertaining, it is true that all places of spiritual significance right now are on Earth. Uh, shrines, temples, cathedrals, places in nature where one feels particularly connected to God, these are all found on Earth, except for one. And that is the overview effect, which is found in Earth orbit. The shift in perspective triggered by personally viewing the Earth from above has been likened to a religious experience by a number of astronauts and often has a completely transformative effect upon those who experience it. It's a profound revelation of how fragile and finite, finite Earth is. Um, astronauts routinely return to Earth significantly affected by it and the pictures that they brought back with them as well have transformed humanity's view of our planet. Um, our understanding of Earth as our one home kind of underwent a paradigm shift catalyzed by images such as Earthrise, um, captured in 1968 by Bill Anders, um, and did things like boost the popula popularity of the environmentalist movement. Um, in a way, humanity itself experienced a kind of spiritual awakening. Um, but aside from this, the places and spaces um, in which people hope to encounter the divine are still all found on Earth holy cities, sacred rivers, none of them yet exist beyond this planet. And so for the faithful living on Mars, it may be that Earth itself becomes a site of pilgrimage. Um, obviously a very costly endeavor, especially in the early stages of Martian migration and perhaps something that people just won't be able to do. Um, and so perhaps the physical places of Earth may by sheer necessity fade in importance and new places on Mars emerge as sites of spiritual significance, maybe even intentionally blessed to be so, um, so that people on Mars can have the same encounter with the divine that people on Earth can. Now, regardless of religion, I believe that Mars will develop its own kind of myth and folklore. Um, one good exploration of this in fiction is actually in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. Um, Alongside interesting explorations of existing religions, he suggests a number of mythical beings that enter the cultural consciousness of those who settle. So there's Big Man, who um, is a kind of personification of the massiveness of Martian geology due to its low gravity. Um, 
It was Paul Bunyan and his big blue ox, the lumberjack folk figure of the American frontier, repurposed for the Martian frontier, playing a kind of trickster god to the, the big man's ice giant and carving out a place for himself on Mars. And then there were the little red men, um, who sometimes you saw out of the corner of your eye or who whispered in your ear while you slept. The kind of cultural memories of the days that we believe that there might be intelligent life on Mars. Now, just for fun, I did my own exploration of the kind of cultural touchstones that we might bring with us uh, were a Mars mission to launch today. So, uh, here goes. Our precursor figures might include David Bowie, a, a cultural icon who became associated with space, aliens, and the question of life on Mars. Or Mark Watney, the, the figure who survived everything that Mars could throw at him and kind of exists as a, an encouraging figure just beyond the horizon uh, for people who seek to do the same. Or um, the, the rovers and, and landing sites on Mars. Um, we like to personify space missions nowadays, and the spirit, opportunity, and curiosity rovers are all intrepid explorers named for qualities that drive us to explore new worlds. And perhaps in the future, they will get their own pilgrims and visitors seeking to connect with those qualities. And um, perhaps the peak of Olympus Mons might become a site of transcendence. Uh, unlike its Mount Olympus counterpart on Earth, it reaches 16 miles into space, not quite beyond the Martian atmosphere, but truly as close as you'll get in the solar system to a mountain that pierces the heavens. Now, this is all speculation and guesswork, and only time will actually tell as to what gets brought with us to Mars and what gets left behind on Earth as a local tradition. Um, and there's a zillion things I haven't touched upon, like diet, family, uh, dress, funerals, anything like that. But for now, in the meantime, um, as for me personally, a person of faith hoping to make that journey for myself one day, um, I'm just going to choose to consider the change of perspective that I may receive from the act of changing a single word. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on Mars, as it is in heaven. Thank you very much. Any questions? Brilliant, brilliant talk. Thank, thank you thank very you. much for, for doing the, the intellectual work which was long. I'm interested in your thoughts about how to manage the, what I perceive as the inevitable tension between the empathy that you require, particularly in the small group, empathy and ecumenicism, versus those faiths which require missionary work and proselytization. Mm. LDS, Jehovah's Witnesses, proselytizing atheists. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there, there is a tension there, and I, I think um, that it, it's, a, it's a hard tension to resolve. And I think it, it's only, um, I guess, something you can resolve by encouraging people to um, to openly share with each other um, their, their faith and kind of, you know, be, be unashamed about, about sharing their positions and say, okay, this is what I believe and why, and that be an acceptable conversation to have. Um, and then kind of leaving it there and trusting that if that seed is going to take, then it will take, and if it doesn't, you've said your piece and you kind of don't have to hammer it home. And so, yeah, I think, I think encouraging dialogue uh, would be one way of kind of addressing that. Just one quick question. I agree with you, it was brilliant, but have you written anything about this? Where can we find more about this subject? Because I found it really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I've <laughs> so so I, I mean I'm I'm writing this up as a kind of um, you know paper that I, I will you know hopefully put up on the Mars Society archives and it will contain references to articles and stuff yeah. and um, I, I'm glad there's interest in, in more work on it and hopefully it's something that I'll have the time to expand upon in the future. So thank you. Anything else? Oh yeah. I found it super fascinating. Um, do you think that there will be a large number of astronauts who have kind of a, another version of the overview effect where they get to Mars and that, in a sense, makes them spiritual or religious? Do you see that as a, a Martian religion forming just by the transformative experience? Uh, yeah, I think that is in, entirely possible. And, you know, the overview effect might hint towards, um, you know, some kind of general. Um, experience uh, fr from being in a new place. I, I think it's interesting to to note that there are already kind of 
semi-religious spiritual discussions that people are having up, um, about kind of what uh, settling Mars might might do to um, uh, to, to humanity and the sort of spiritual development that that might grant. So. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a possibility. It'll be interesting then to to see what what people's responses uh, are when when they do land on Mars and 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 live there, and whether that that does kind of tap into something spiritual within them. Do we have time for one more? No. Yeah. Okay. I oh, will wrap it up there. I'm, I'm happy to talk further over coffee and everything else, though. Thank you very much. Thank you.